Welcome to chapter 20 um, on the heart for A and P2. So um, today we really start covering a lot of the cardiovascular system. And this is going to consist of blood, the heart, um, and various blood vessels. And we've already talked about the blood last time. So the heart is what we're going to be focusing on today. And this is going to um, be essentially a pump that is going to circulate blood through an estimated 75,000 miles of blood vessels. So it covers a lot of area of real estate. Um, the left side of the heart is going to plump, pump blood through an estimated 100,000 kilometers or 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels. Um, <clears throat> and this is going to be equivalent to traveling, or, traveling around the Earth's equator about three times. So it, again, it's, it's quite, the, quite an impressive feat. The right side of the heart is going to pump blood through the lungs, and this is going to enable blood to pick up oxygen and on, unload any sort of carbon dioxide that's been picked up from the tissues. I think most people are probably pretty familiar with the location of the heart. It's going to rest um, on the diaphragm, and this is going to be near the midline of the thoracic cavity. The heart is going to lie within the mediastinum, and this is an anatomical region that extends from the sternum to the vertebral column and then from the first rib of the, uh, to the diaphragm. And it's going to be between the lungs. About two-thirds of the mass of the heart are going to lie uh, to the left of the body's midline. And you can kind of visualize this by thinking about a cone lying on its side. The pointed apex of the heart is going to form the tip to form is going to be formed by the tip of the left ventricle. This is the lower chamber of the heart. And it's going to rest on the diaphragm. It's going to be directed anteriorly and inferiorly as well as to the left. The base of the heart is going to, um, going to be opposite the apex and it is going to be um, the posterior aspect of the heart. Um, it's going to be formed by the atria. These are the upper chambers of the heart, and it's mostly going to be formed, and mostly the left atrium specifically, is going to form this base. So in addition to the apex and the base, the heart is going to have several distinct surface features. The anterior surface um, of the heart is going to be deep to the sternum and the ribs. The inferior surface um, is going to be the part of the heart that's between the apex and the right surface, and it's going to rest mostly on the diaphragm. The right surface is going to face the right lung, and it's going to extend uh, from the inferior surface to the base, and the left surface is going to face the left lung, and it's going to extend from the base to the apex. So because the heart lies between two rigid structures, um, the ribs and the vertebral column, the uh, or excuse me, the sternum of the vertebral column. Um, the external compressions on that are can be done on the chest can be used to force blood out of the heart and into circulation. So this is why CPR actually works and helps to pump blood when your heart's not pu pumping blood properly. The first su structure that is associated with the heart that we're going to discuss is called the pericardium. Um, this is basically a sac that's going to enclose the heart and it's going to keep it and, and kind of hold it into place. Um, it's going to be, conf the pericardium is going to confine the heart um, in it, or to its position in the mediastinum and it is going to allow it sufficient freedom in order to move for the vigorous and rapid contractions that are needed um, for the heart to pump blood. Um, so the pericardium is a serous membrane so again, as usual, like what we see in most of these serous membranes, it is going to be a double-layered membrane with our parietal, our pericardial, and visceral, uh, uh, the parietal and our visceral layer. The visceral layer is going to be the inner of our layers, where the parietal layer is going to be the outer layer of our serous membrane. And then this potential space that's between um, these two layers is going to be the pericardial cavity. So. The um, pericardium is going to consist of two main parts. We've got the fibrous pericardium and the serous pericardium. The superficial fibrous pericardium is going to be composed of tough, inelastic, and dense irregular connective tissue. 
Um, it's going to resemble a bag that is going to rest on and attach to the diaphragm and its open end is going to be fused with the connective tissue of the blood vessels that are entering and leaving the heart. The fibrous pericardium is going to prevent overstretching of the heart and it's going to provide uh, protection and anchor the heart to the mediastinum. The fibrous pericardium near the apex of the heart is going to be partially fused to the central tendon of the diaphragm and is therefore um, going to allow for movement of the diaphragm as in deep breathing. This is going to help to facilitate the movement of blood by the heart. The second part of the pericardium is the deeper pericard that's the deeper serous pericardium and this is going to be a thinner more delicate membrane that's going to form that double layer around the heart that we mentioned. The outer parietal layer of the serous, mem uh, serous pericardium is going to fuse to the uh, fibrous pericardium and the inner visceral layer of the serous pericardium um, which is also going to be called the epicardium is going to be one of the layers um, of the heart wall and it's going to also adhere tightly to the surface of the heart. So between the parietal and visceral layers of the serous pericardium, there's going to be a thin film of lubricating serous fluid. And so within, uh, so it, this is going to be a slippery secretion um, that's going to be secreted by those pericardial cells, and it's known as pericardial fluid. This is going to work act in reducing friction between the layers of the serous pericardium as the heart moves. So it helps to keep everything from grinding up against each other, those tissues from rubbing up against each other as the heart contracts. The space that contains a, f um, a few millimeters of pericardial fluid is going to be called the pericardial cavity that we mentioned before. Um, so you can kind of see here where that pericardial cavity would be and that's going to be filled with the pericardial fluid. So I have included um, the Wiley Plus links for um, the he uh, various anatomical overviews um, for this chapter as well. So those are those links are included in the PowerPoint. That brings us then to the layers of the heart wall. There are going to be three main layers that make up the heart wall. There's the endocardium, the myocardium, and the endocard excuse me, the epicardium, the endocardium, and the myocardium. Oh my goodness. And the endocardium. I'm sorry. Clearly my brain is not plugged in today. Anyhow, epicardium, myocardium, and endocardium. There we go. Finally got it right. So starting with the epicardium. The epicardium is composed of two tissue layers. The outermost is called the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. This is a thin, transparent outer layer of the heart wall, and it's composed of mesothelium. Beneath that mesothelium is going to be a variable layer of delicate fibroelastic tissue, as well as some adipose tissue. The adipose tissue is going to predominate and um, is going to become thickest over the ventricular surface. And this is where it's going to house the majority, uh, the major coronary and cardiac vessels of the heart. The amount of fat is going to vary from person to person and it's going to correspond to the general extent of body fat in an individual person or an individual and typically it's going to increase with age so the older you are and or the larger you are the more body fat you have the more of this uh, adipose tissue you're going to have around the heart there the epicardium is going to impart a smooth sort of slippery texture to the outermost surface of the heart and this is also going to contain blood vessels lymphatic uh, and uh, lymphatic vessels and vessels that supply the um, supply the myocardium. The next layer we have is the myocardium. This is the middle um, the middle layer. This is the middle myocardium um, of the heart, and it, this is going to be responsible for the pumping action that we associate so well with the heart. Um, it's going to be composed of cardiac muscle tissue, hence the name myocardium. The myocardium is going to make up approximately 95% of the heart wall. So this is a large chunk of the heart wall is going to be made up of this particular layer, this middle layer, this myocardium. The muscle fibers or the muscle cells, um, just like what those that we see in striated skeletal muscles, um, are going to be wrapped and bundled with connective tissue sheaths that are going to be composed of 
um, endomesium and paramecium. The cardiac muscle fibers are going to be organized in bundles that are going to kind of swirl diagonally around the heart and are going to generate a strong pumping action of the heart as that uh, muscular layer contracts. So here we can see kind of our the swirling that they're talking about here. So although um, the um, the myo the those cardiac muscle fibers are going to be striated like skeletal muscles. It's important to remember that cardiac muscle is going to be an involuntary muscle, um, just like what we see with smooth muscle. So we don't have to think about actively having our heart contract and pump blood. It's just going to do it in, in an involuntary manner. The third layer of the um, heart wall is going to be the endocardium. And this is the innermost layer, and this is going to be a thin layer of endothelium that's going to overlie, um, that's going to have an overlaying, um, a thin layer of connective tissue. It's going to provide a smooth lining for the chambers of the heart, and it's going to cover the valves of the heart. The surface endothelial lining is going to minimize the surface friction as that blood passes through the heart. So that's just important. It helps to kind of make those blood cells last a little longer if we reduce that friction. The endocardium is also going to be continuous with the endothelial lining of the large blood vessels that are going to attach to the heart. So this is all basically going to become the same, um, the same tissue. All right, next we have the various chambers of the heart that are going to make up the heart. The chambers of the heart are going to include the two upper atria and the two lower ventricles. The surface of the heart um, is uh, excuse me, on, on the surface of the heart, we're also going to have something called an oracle and a sulci, or a sulcus, um, for singular. So the oracles are going to be small pouches on the anterior surface of the atrium, and these are going to be s help to increase or slightly increase the capacity of each of the atriums. All right. Um, so here we can see the, that oracle there. This is kind of just to help give it a little extra, a little extra blood volume, a little extra capacity. And then the sulci are going to be grooves that are going to contain blood vessels as well as fat, um, and they're also going to separate the chambers. Um, so, so start for starters, we're going to start with the right atrium. All right, the this is going to form the right surface of the heart and the is going to receive blood from three veins. It's going to receive blood from the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. Veins are also, are, uh, so it's important to remember that veins are always going to carry blood towards the heart, veins towards the heart. Arteries are going to carry it away. So the right atrium is going to be about two to three millimeters in average thickness. And the anterior and posterior walls of the right atrium are going to be very different. Um, the inside um, of the posterior wall is going to be very smooth, and the inside of the anterior wall is going to be rough due to the presence of muscular ridges called uh, pectinate muscles, uh, and this is also going to extend into the auricles. Between the right atrium and the left atrium, there's going to be a thin partition that's called the internal septum. Blood is going to pass from the right atrium into the right ventricle through a valve that is called the tricuspid valve. Um, and this is because it has, um, it's going to consist of three cusps or, or leaflets that are going to allow it to open. Um, so you can see our tricuspid valve here. So functionally, the right atrium is going to receive blood from the superior and inferior vena cava and from the coronary sinus. In the septum that separates the right and the left atria is going to be an oval depression called the fossa ovalis. And this is going to be a remnant of the foramen oval that's um, present during uh, development. Blood is going to pass from the right atrium into the left ventricle through the tricuspid valve. Next we have the right ventricle. This is going to be about four to five millimeters thick on average 
and it is going to form most of the anterior surface of the heart. The inside of the right ventricle is going to contain a series of ridges that are formed by these raised bundles of cardiac muscle fibers called the, um, called the trabeculae carnea or carnea. Um, so some of these trabeculae carnea are going to convey part of the conduction of elect like electrical conduction of the heart um, system of the heart. So it's going to help to move that sort of electrical impulse. The cusps of the tricuspid valve are going to be connected to tendon-like cords called the chordae tendinae. Um, and these are in turn going to be connected to a cone-shaped uh, to the cone-shaped uh, trabeculae carniae, um, and these are called papillary muscles. Internally, the right ventricle is going to be separated from the left ventricle by a partition called the intraventricular septum, and blood is going to pass from the right ventricle through the pulmonary valve and then into a large artery called the pulmonary trunk. This is going to be divided into a right and a left pulmonary arteries and is going to carry blood to the lungs. So it's important to remember, again, that while veins carry blood towards the heart, arteries are always going to carry blood from the heart, away from the heart. So an, an easy way to remember it is that arteries carry blood away. So functionally, the right ventricle is going to receive blood from the right atrium and it's going to send blood to the lungs. The right ventricle is going to form most of the anterior surface of the heart and blood is going to pass from the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk via the pulmonary semilunar valves. <clears throat> they are called this pulmonary semilunar valves or pulmonary valves or the semilunar valves uh, because um, they, these, these, the flaps of the valve look like half moons. Next we have the left atrium. The left atrium is about the same thickness as the right atrium and it's going to form most of the base of the heart. It receives blood from the lungs through four of the pulmonary veins. Just like the right atrium, the inside of the left atrium is going to have a smooth posterior wall. Because the pectinate muscles are going to be confined to the auricles of the left atrium, the anterior wall of the left atrium is also going to be smooth. Blood is going to pass from the left atrium into the left ventricle through the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve. Um, and as this name implies, it, this is because it has two cusps. The term mitral is in mitral valve is going to be due to the resemblance of the bicuspid valve to a bishop's uh, mitre or like those those goofy hats that like bishops will wear, um, the crazy pointy hats. Um, and so a, somebody who saw this initially thought that this particular valve looked kind of like the bishop's hat, so they named it the mitral valve. Um, this valve is going to be two-sided, and it is also going to be called the left anterior anteroventricle excuse me, anteroventricle uh, valve. Um, so functionally, the left atrium is going to receive blood from the pulmonary veins. The left atrium receives, oh sorry, that's on there twice. Um, blood is going to pass from the left atrium to the left ventricles through the bicuspid valve or the, through the mitral valve, the same thing here. The Next up we have the left ventricle. This is going to be the thickest of the heart chambers and this is going to average uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 millimeters in, in thickness. Um, and this is what's going to form the apex of the heart. We can see that left ventricle right here and you can see that significantly different, that much increased um, thickness that we have in that left ventricle. Just like the right ventricle, the left ventricle is going to contain the trabeculae carnae or carnier, excuse me, and is also going to have the chordae um, tendinae. Um, and these are going to anchor the cusps of the bicuspid valve to those papillary muscles. Blood is going to pass from the left ventricle through the aortic valves into the ascending or aorta, and some of the blood um, in the aorta is going to flow into the coronary arteries. This is going to branch from the ascending aorta and is going to carry blood to the heart wall. The 
Um, the remainder of that blood is going to pass into the arch of the aorta and the dis descending aorta. Branches of the of the arch of the aorta are going to dis and the descending aorta are going to carry blood throughout the body. Um, so during fetal life, there's going to be a temporary blood vessel um, that's called the ductus arterius, and this is going to shunt blood from the pulmonary trunk into the aorta. So hence, there's only a small little amount of blood is going to enter the non-functioning fetal lungs. Um, this is because your lungs aren't really fully developed until right before you're born, just about. So the ductus arterius is normally going to close shortly after birth. And this is going to leave a remnant um, known as the ligamentum arteriosum, uh, which sounds like a Harry Potter spell if you ask me. Um, but anyhow, this is going to connect the arch of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So functionally, the left ventricle, um, the left atrium is going to receive blood from the left ventricle and it's going to send blood um, all over the body. The left ventricle is going to form the apex of the heart and blood is going to pass from the left ventricle through the aortic semilunar valves and into the aorta. That brings us in to the fibrous skeleton of the heart. Um, so in addition to cardiac muscle tissue, the heart wall is also going to contain a dense connective tissue that's going to form the fibrous skeleton of the heart. Um, essentially, the fibrous skeleton is going to consist of four dense connective tissue rings. You can see those rings here, um, and these are going to be surround. These are going to surround the valves of the heart. They're going to fuse with one another, and they're going to merge with the intraventricular septum. So, in addition to forming the structural foundation for the heart valves, the fibrous skeleton is going to prevent overstretching of those valves as blood passes through them. It's also going to serve as a point of insertion for the bundles of cardiac muscle fibers, and it's going to act as an electrical insulator between the atria and the ventricles. So, now that we've talked about the chambers of the heart, we can look at the valves um, of the heart and the circulation of that blood. So the valves of the heart are going to open and close in response to pressure changes as the heart contracts and relaxes. The right and left atrioventricular valves um, are going to prevent backflow from the ventricles into the atria. And the right and left semilunar valves are going to prevent backflow from the arteries into the ventricles. So we're trying to keep everything flowing in one direction. We don't want backflow. That would be a very inefficient sort of way to move blood throughout the, through the heart. So as far as operation of the atrioventricular valves, um, there's a couple of things that we need to discuss. So because these valves are located between the atrium and a ventricle, um, the tricuspid and bicuspid valves are going to be termed atrioventricular valves or AV valves. When an AV valve is open, it's going to have the rounded ends of the cups of the cusps are going to project into the ventricles. And when the ventricles are relaxed, the papillary muscles are going to also be relaxed, and the chordae tendinae are going to be slack. This allows blood to move from a higher pressure in the atria to a lower pressure in the ventricles through these open AV valves. Um, when the ventricles contract, however, the pressure of the blood is going to drive the cusps upward um, until their edges are going to meet and close the opening. So at the same time, the papillary muscle con muscles are going to contract, and this is going to pull on and tighten those chordae tendinae. This whole action is going to prevent the valve cusps from everting or opening into the atria, so like flapping through to the other side. Um, and this is going to be a good thing because you wouldn't want that to happen in response to a high ventricular pressure. Um, so it's opposing that high ventricular pressure. If the AV valves or the chordae tendinae are damaged in some way, blood can be regurgitated or there can be flow back um, into the atria when the ventricles contract. So you're not having blood moving in that kind of circular mov movement. It's kind of flowing backwards, is kind of backwashing um, into, back into the atria. Next we have the semilunar valves. So the aorta and the pulmonary valves are known as semilunar valves, and this is because they are made up of three crescent moon-shaped cusps. Um, 
And each of these cusps is going to be attached to the arterial wall by a convex outer margin. These semilunar valves are going to allow for ejection of blood from the heart into the arteries, but it is going to prevent backflow of blood into the ventricles. The free borders of the cusps are going to project into the lumen of the artery, um, and when the ventricles contract, pressure is going to build up in the chambers. The semilunar valves are going to open when pressure in the ventricles exceeds the pressure um, that's found in the arteries. And this is going to allow for the ejection of blood from the ventricles into that pulmonary trunk in the aorta. As the ventricles relax, blood is going to start to flow back towards the heart. And this backflow is, of blood is going, uh, or backflowing blood is going to fill the valve cusps, which is going to cause the free edges of our semilunar valves to contact each other and close tightly. Um, this is going to close off the opening between the ventricles and the arteries, again, preventing any kind of backflow. So, now moving on to the different types of circulation. We can break these down into systemic and pulmonary circulation. So in postnatal circulation, the heart is going to pump blood into two closed circuits with each beat. All right, we have our systemic circulation and our pulmonary circulation. The two circuits are going to be arranged in a series. The output of one is going to become the input of another, or of the other. And as the, you know, so as would happen if you were to attach two garden hoses um, to each other. The left side of the heart is going to pump blood for systemic circulation, and it's going to, to receive bright red oxygenated blood from the lungs. The left ventricle is going to eject blood into the aorta, um, and from the aorta, the blood is going to divide into uh, separate streams, and it's going to enter progressively smaller systemic arteries that are going to carry it to all the various organs throughout the body, except for those air sacs or the alveoli that we see in the lungs. These are going to be supplied by the pulmonary circulation. So in systemic tissue, arteries are going to give rise to smaller diameter arterioles, which are finally going to lead to an extensive bed, um, to extensive beds in capillary systems. Exchange of nutrients and gases is going to occur within these little thin capillary walls. It allows for a diffusion to happen quite easily. Um, blood is going to unload oxygen and it's going to pick up CO2. And in most cases, blood is going to flow through only one capillary and then it's going to enter a systemic venule. These venules are going to carry the deoxygenated blood away from the tissue and are going to merge to form larger systemic veins. And ultimately, that blood is going to flow back into the right atrium. So the right side of the heart is going to pump blood for the pulmonary circulation. It receives all of that dark red, very maroon colored deoxygenated blood that's returning from the systemic circulation. So blood is ejected from the right ventricle and then flows into the pulmonary trunk. Um, which is then going to branch into pulmonary arteries that are going to carry blood to the right and left lungs. In pulmonary capillaries, um, the blood is going to offload CO2, which is going to be then exhaled, and it's going to pick up oxygen from that inhaled air. The freshly oxygenated blood is then going to flow into the pulmonary veins, and it's going to return to the left atrium, and the cycle will repeat. So here we have a really nice... Um, I think slide talking about that looks at the flow of blood. Um, we can see here that starting with the right atrium with our deoxygenated blood here, all right, this is going to flow through the tricuspid valves and into the right ventricle. It's then going to flow out uh, through the pulmonary valves and into the pulmonary trunk and the uh, pulmonary arteries. Right. Then it's going to flow um, in the pulmonary uh, capillaries. The blood is going to lose its CO2 and it's going to gain oxygen Right, and the, where it interacts with the lungs there. From there then that blood is going to move through to the pulmonary veins which is where it's going to pick up oxygen from the lungs. It's going to flow through those pulmonary veins as oxygenated blood now. All right. uh, it's going to move into the left atrium and then it's going to move um, into the tri through the bicuspid valve, um, it's going to move through the bicuspid valve and into the left ventricle, which we can't actually see on this picture because it's kind of in the back there. Anyhow, the from that left ventricle, then it's going to flow through the um, 
oh sorry we can't see through the left ventricle oops through our left ventricle there um, and then it's going to flow through that left from that left ventricle into our aortic valve or through the aortic valve into the aortic the aorta and that so systemic arteries and then that um, is going to carry that oxygenated blood um, through the systemic capillaries um, and where the blood is going to uh, deposit that oxy oxygen to the tissues and it's going to pick up any CO2 that's been produced by that by those cells and then it's going to go that um, that deoxygenated blood then is going to flow through the superior vena cava the inferior vena cava and the coronary sinuses and then it's going to end up back in the right atrium again as that deoxygenated blood so that is the flow of blood um, through the heart in the two um, systemic and pulmonary circuits or circulation that we have there we then have something called coronary circulation and this is basically just going to be the flow of blood through coronary arteries that's going to deliver oxygenated blood and nutrients to the myocardium the branches are going to arise from the ascending aorta and the coronary veins are going to remove carbon dioxide and waste that's produced by the myocardium. These branches are going to con uh, converge at the coronary sinus. And so here you can see all of the coronary circulation, the various veins and arteries that are going to supply the heart with oxygen um, and remove any sort of waste or CO2 that's produced by this tissue. Um, so that is all that we have here. We can see just, um, again, just another little illustration of the coronary circulation for the heart. So that is all that we have to cover for part one of the um, heart lecture. So as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to contact me or ask after class. Um, thanks so much and have a great day.